So in this section, we're going to take a look at the different metamorphic classes, metamorphic grade, and the metamorphic facies. So what's really important to remember with all metamorphic rocks that the protolith determines the end rock. For example, I can't start out with a basalt or a gabbro and end up with a marble. Right? You have to have the right ingredients to make the right rocks. So this means we can really kind of divide up them into some fairly large compositional classes. So let's take a look at each one of these. The first is our peltic protoliths, which is the shale protoliths. So remember, it starts out right as mud or fine grain clay, and with the effects of pressure, it'll turn into slate, phyllite, schist, or nice, depending upon the pressure grade. We can also start out with a mafic metamorphic class, um, which this one should be obvious to you at this point. You've heard this word a lot through the course of the semester. That's going to be basalt or gabbro. Okay, so it's going to start out as our low silica igneous rock. And as we mentioned, that's going to turn into um, our amphiboles, our amphibolites. And we can also see um, biotites in there, which remember are the mafic varieties of our micas. We can also have a calcareous protolith, which is carbonates. This is mostly our limestones and dolostones, so it's going to start out mostly as calcite, right? and it can turn into that marble. And then we can have this fancy sounding one here, our quartzo feldspathic, which hopefully you recognize that that means it has a lot of quartz and a lot of feldspar, which is basically granite. Okay, so when we take granite. Um, it's really pretty stable under any kind of metamorphism because it's a pretty durable rock. But with the extreme amounts of pressure, it can become foliated and turn into some of those gneisses. So if we take a look at different metamorphic intensity, I like this diagram because it sums pretty much everything up. Here along the top, we have increasing temperature. Here we have increasing pressure. And of course, pressure increases with depth as does temperature. So we're going to come back and we're going to see this diagram here again in a few minutes with more rock names added to it. But generically, we can kind of divide this up, you see, into three sections here. So at the very top, we have contact metamorphism, which we'll talk more about that in the next section. But this is basically right where we've got an igneous intrusion that's baking the rocks around it. So this is definitely the effects of high temperature, not high pressure, high temperature. Of course, the middle of the road is our shale protoliths. Okay, going from shale to phyllite to slate to gneiss. This is where we have two continents colliding, right, basically making a mountain belt. Um, so we see the effects of pressure and temperature. And then on the extreme end over here, we have subduction, which actually makes its own fairly unique uh, foliated rocks down here. But as you can see, these, are, these rocks are experiencing more pressure than they are temperature. So where we see that increasing temperature and pressure, we call this prograde metamorphism. This is basically what we see with um, slate, phyllite, schist, and gneiss. That as you continue to bury the rock and it experiences higher pressures and temperatures, it changes in a very predictable manner to the next one. Right. So as we start with shale, we can go to phyllite, schist, and gneiss. Retrograde is basically the opposite where we have metamorphism that happens due to decreasing temperature and pressure. And this is basically going to happen due to you know, those phase changes. As we take a rock and bring it up really quickly, right, exhume it really fast, um, it experiences those low temperatures and low pressures. And some of those rocks just might not be stable at low pressures and temperatures. And that will cause them to metamorphose. Of course, we can take a look at index minerals, and we kind of I kind of mentioned this with Bowen's reaction series, that it's really important to understand the different zones in which our metamorphic rocks form. For example, if we take a look at this diagram over here, we see we've got our high-grade sylmanite represented in red. So that means this whole area in here experienced very high temperature and very high pressure. And of course, as you move away from this region, you see it gets to more low-grade. So as a historical geologist, I might want to try to figure out what happened to this region, you know, 500 million years ago to cause these rocks to form in this manner. 
So now we can really kind of come back and fill in that metamorphic facies. So here we see that same diagram from before, but with the actual rock names on there, right? You see hornfells and green schist and amphibolites and blue schist and eclogite. So our different mineral names. And you can follow the different pathways. So pathway number one up here at the top, this is due to um, contact metamorphism. So this is the baking, remember, that occurs around an igneous intrusion. So high temperatures, but not high pressures at all. And that forms mostly those horn fells. Number two is a volcanic arc. So if we follow this line here, you can see it's high temperatures, but slightly higher pressures. That's because we have subduction going on. Of course, you have an igneous intrusion wherever you have volcanoes, but we have subduction going on, which is going to add a little bit of pressure in there. If we look at number three, this is your collisional mountain belt, so continent, continent collision. You see it's that middle of the road where we're going to go from um, uh, slate to phyllite to schist to gneiss. Number four is stable continent. This is just burial over time. Right, The older the rocks are, the more they're going to get buried and of course experience the, the effects of temperature and pressure. And then number five is your accretionary prism. This is what's happening in subduction. You see that it experiences very high pressures before the temperatures catch up with it. And that definitely forms our metamorphic rocks. One thing I do wanna point out here is this other dotted line over here on the right hand side. This is where you can see the effect of pressure that has on uh, the melting point. So that line I just traced out is the melting point of your felsic rocks. So at low temperature or low pressure, it takes a very high temperature to melt them. However, right when we are under high pressure, notice that it doesn't take a very high temperature to melt them anymore. So it is important to note that the higher pressures rocks are, the higher pressure a rock experiences, the easier it can melt.